Hello. I'm going to talk about why aviation matters for the Scottish Climate Assembly. The aviation sector is a source of climate warming emissions, like all transport sectors. This graph shows how greenhouse gas emissions emitted per passenger kilometre from flying compares with other modes of transport, green being better, red being worse. As with those other sectors, if the climate related warming from aviation isn't mitigated through cutting the emissions produced by aircraft when we fly, then other sectors will need to reduce their emissions even more to remain consistent with the carbon budget and goals as laid out in the Global Paris Climate Agreement. However, there are some things about the aviation sector that are much more problematic than road and rail transport and to a large extent sea transport as well. The first is that aircraft fly at altitude, climbing to around 10 kilometres in the air when they are cruising. Our atmosphere has somewhat different chemistry away from the Earth's surface and so emissions released directly into the sensitive parts of our atmosphere will have a different impact than if those emissions had been released on the ground. According to a recent and highly regarded academic study, two thirds of the amount of climate warming from the aviation sector since 1940, as before then flying was uncommon, has been caused by emissions other than carbon dioxide, soot, water vapor and nitrous oxide that are released high up in our atmosphere. The other third of the warming comes from the emission of carbon dioxide, an important greenhouse gas, but one that does not react with the sensitive parts of our atmosphere, but instead mixes into the atmosphere and with its lifetime of over 100 years, accumulates to also warm the planet. Another problematic thing for aviation is that the infrastructure the sector uses, aircraft and airports, tend to last a very long time, around 30 years for an aircraft with only incremental changes to improve energy efficiency year on year. This means that cutting emissions significantly in the short timeframes needed to meet the Paris Climate Agreement relies on making changes to existing types of aircraft or airports, rather than radical new aircraft designs. Changes to existing aircraft include things like improving the energy efficiency of the airframe by adding wing tips, building them with lighter materials or improving the efficiency of their engines. Such changes that each reduce the amount of fossil fuel needed to fly the aircraft have been happening for decades, which means that aircraft are very well designed to minimize fuel burn as best they can. But that also means that it is more and more difficult to keep making those efficiency changes. Although there are some new design concepts that are much more fuel efficient, one is called the blended wing body aircraft, it is not expected that these will be widespread throughout the fleet until at least the 2040s. Reducing the energy needed to fly is one way to cut climate warming emissions from aircraft. Another is to find a different fuel to burn in the engine. Currently aircraft use kerosene, a very energy dense fossil fuel. The fuel needs to be dense because aircraft need a lot of power to lift them into the air, unlike other types of transport and a reason why flying is so emission intensive. Finding alternatives to fossil fuel kerosene is the topic of much research. Alternative fuels that can include kerosene derived from waste or biofuel, as long as it uses renewable energy to make the conversion, or new fuels such as hydrogen or ammonia. There is also research and testing of electric or battery powered aircraft. Different types of aircraft are suitable for different types of flight, for example, electric aircraft are expected to be suitable for small aircraft that do short hop trips, the type that serve the highlands and islands, for instance. To travel a distance of a thousand kilometers, a common distance to travel to Europe, other fuels such as hydrogen, sustainable aviation fuels from waste, for example, or ammonia will be needed. While there is a lot of interest in such zero emission aircraft, the UK government's own Jet Zero Council has goals of designing a zero emission aircraft that can go a thousand kilometers and take a hundred people by 2030. It also has a goal of a zero emission transatlantic demonstrator flight by 2040. These goals reinforce the point that if the aviation sector is to reduce its emissions in a similar way to other sectors, 
then these technologies offer too little too late. Low or zero emission aircraft would need to be th needed throughout the international fleet much sooner. So what else can be done? There are ways to reduce emissions by having a more efficient air traffic control system, one that reduces circling, for example. Improving air traffic operations could reduce emissions by a few percent, but this may also have an unintended consequence that allows airspace to be used more, which could in the end lead to more, not less emissions. The third option after technology and operations is to reduce the demand for flying, noting that domestic flights emit the most emissions per kilometre travelled compared with short or long haul flights and short haul flights are four times worse than ferry travel. Cutting demand is controversial, but if emissions are to be reduced from this sector in a similar way to others, then demand must be part of the portfolio changes needed, particularly until new fuels and airframes are widely deployed. Demand can be managed through policy measures such as raising prices or taxes, implementing something like a frequent flyer levy, encouraging more train or ferry travel and video conferencing meetings like Zoom, or quite simply not expanding our airports. So these are a few things Scottish policymakers could explore. It is widely recognised within academic studies that cutting emissions from aviation in the timeframe dictated by the Paris Climate Agreement requires a reduction in growth. This means that if air transport is to grow in developing countries, similar to levels in developed parts of the world, then we will need to reduce the number of flights taken by some individuals in those wealthier parts of the world. A recent academic study estimates that only 2 to 4% of the global population flew internationally in 2018, and 1% of the world's population is responsible for about half of the emissions from aviation globally. In other words, frequent flying is behind a big chunk of aviation emissions. The final option is known as offsetting. Because of the technology constraints I outlined above, the aviation industry has established offsetting as a key part of how it will contribute emission cuts. Offsetting means that the aviation industry will pay another industry or sector to cut their emissions instead. This increases the costs paid by airlines. Such a scheme might be appropriate if only small cuts in emissions were needed by all sectors but the changes required by the Global Paris Climate Agreement will push all sectors to their limit, leaving offsetting questionable at best. At the end of the day, what the Paris Climate Agreement lays out is hugely demanding for all sectors, and aviation needs to play its part, particularly as it contributes additional warming because of where aircraft fly. Reducing emissions in the near term is essential, as some of the emissions released by aviation, such as carbon dioxide, accumulate in the atmosphere for hundreds of years. Technological options to cut emissions from aircraft are highly limited in the next couple of decades. So mechanisms to manage the demand for flying in developed countries must be part of the mix. Electric aircraft and new fuels will come, but not sufficiently quickly to deal with the problems we currently face. Thank you.